Um, we are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is right there. I pledge allegiance to the, the flag of the United States of America and to the development for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Jim Batson. Here. Kara Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Kara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. We note everybody present. Um, we extend a special welcome to our new student board reps. We are very happy to have you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, on tonight's agenda, um, we will start with communication. Um, student recognition that was scheduled for tonight has been moved to September. So we will start with an invitation for public comment. Following that, there will be a student school board rep report. Um, we will have a presentation about the D128 Foundation for Learning big event. Uh, we will review the FOIA request that was received and acknowledge a donation and uh, have some good news. We have a lot of good news to report. Um, then we will proceed to our consent vote agenda. Um, just as a reminder, the consent vote includes items that are routinely approved by the board with one motion. Um, these are things like educational tour requests that we've already discussed in committee. Um, all of these things are, th are uh, items that we've ex discussed extensively in committee. Um, then we will move on to items for action. Uh, we have a second reading and adoption for um, some board policies. This continues with our constant review of our board policies. We're on a schedule where every two years we manage to um, complete a review of the entire board policy. Um, and this is in line with that. Um, we will consider some educational tour requests that came in after our committee meeting that we have not yet had a chance to discuss. Uh, we do have some employment of employees, employees um, that were hired since the last committee meeting um, that we need to approve. And we have an item for just uh, actually two items, I believe, for um, disposal. Um, we will then move on to have a presentation and discussion about the D128 racial equity, diversity and inclusion policy and update on the metrics that are included in that policy. And then the informational portion of the meeting will include the superintendent's report, a capital projects update, an energy audit update that was performed by Verigi. Uh, We will review the fiscal year 22 site-based expenditure reporting. And then we will receive updates from our representative, uh, Jim Batson for the Illinois Association of School Boards and for CEDAL from uh, Kara Benjamin. And then we will um, start a new agenda item um, that include board comments and events. Um, previously, we would had a uh, president's report. We've moved items of that elsewhere in the agenda. And then instead of it being a president's report, we can all sort of report on activities, observations, anything that uh, we've participated in since we last met that we want to share. Um, Finally, we'll discuss future agenda items uh, before we adjourn to, sorry, before we move to convene in closed session for discussion of an employee. Um, this is under um, 5 ILCS 120 2C1. And um, when we return to open session, no further action will be taken and we will adjourn. So we will um, ask, uh, now would be a time, do we have any um Anyone here wishing to uh, address the board in public comment? Oh, that's okay. Is there anybody wishing to address the board tonight? Going once. Okay, seeing none, then we are going to move on uh, to our students. Oh, we have the written one, I'm sorry. We did receive an email public comment. Um, thank you. Yes, I have a message here from Kelly Reinfeldt. We will be a new family at LHS this year with our incoming freshmen. We have three other children who attend Roundout. The fact that the start date for LHS is a full two and a half plus weeks ahead of the other schools was an unpleasant surprise. I know there are many factors that go into the early start date, but in discussion with the many other with many other families, 
there are a large number of parents that feel it is extremely detrimental. Is there any way to look at starting just one week ahead of the surrounding middle schools next year? Lack of family time in August, difficulty in coordinating schedules for working parents, and the lack of lifeguards for local pools, as many LHS students fill those roles, are all negative aspects of such an early start date. We understand it traditionally was important to get finals in before winter break, but many classes are going away from finals. So that reasoning for starting earlier in order to finish the semester and finals before winter break does not seem nearly as necessary as it once did with the lack of finals. It would be great to have better understanding and communication to start date factors. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, thank you. And now we will turn it over to our student board reps for their report. As the school year begins to develop into a full swing of crowded classrooms and lively chatter, students begin to reactivate their brains, transition from the summer high to school, and learn about the expectations and syllabuses of their classes. Maricela Uribe described the school environment as more lighthearted than last year, which was sown in an, in an unsure, tense, and polar debate about masks, student health, and parent concerns. Normal, now a returning reality as almost all students walk the halls and classrooms maskless and teachers bring back hands-on activities from the past has made students like seniors Jackie Gallegos very glad. However, in our returning normal world, we also return to a typical classroom schedule, meaning no Wednesday late starts. For VHHS junior Abby Lee, the change has been positive as last year she felt Wednesday classes were rushed and that she didn't get as much time to do her homework. Contrastingly, for sophomore Eunice, sophomore Nancy Lee, and senior Katie Hughes, it makes the week a long string of days without a break to sleep in, to go figure skating as Nancy does, or to catch up on tests, as supervisor of the testing center Colleen Kennedy explained was the situation for a lot of students. For Hughes, the late start refreshed her more for the school day, giving her more excitement and energy to focus in school and in sports. Another huge change for the incoming senior class is the transition into college preparation. Some seniors like Addison Mooney are a bit unsure and worried as they delve into the Common App and try to puzzle a question I and a lot of my peers stumble upon, which is what we want to be, what we want to major in, and what college we want to go to. Gallegos described it with a bit of worry as she could foresee the huge tasks ahead of her, especially during the senior meeting when students were informed about various topics college career center support opportunities and upcoming college workshops. Nonetheless, seniors and Ms. Lipsing Battle and Powder Puff preparations are finding excitement in their school days. At the Senior Sunset, the first kickoff school event, some like senior Ashley Shoemaker were able to reconnect with friends through games of spike ball and tag, and some like Hughes were reminded of the start of the end of high school. And of course, the playful tradition of wearing childlike, colorful, and elementary-sized Minnie Mouse Minion or Dora backpacks continues, at least among the seniors that find a way to manage their courses without three inch binders and huge amounts of paper. How they do it, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> among a lot of other students, positive changes have been seen throughout. With last year's bus shortage situation now solved and with all buses running smoothly, students like Uribe are thankful. Last year, she, along with several of her peers, had to wait 20 to 30 minutes after school, but she's glad she no longer has to do that saving her some free time in the evening. Additionally, the sports world at VHHS is thriving. VHHS football with a record high turnouts is a big number, surprisingly big. Helmets are a shortage right now, even after borrowing some from LHS, causing some athletes to not have the ability to play. Overall, the school has been daringly entering this new school year, committed to making students' experience positive, challenging, and opportunistic. The Cougars are back and ready to roll. I'm the sorry to interrupt you. It would be super helpful if you don't mind to say your name before you start, just so that everybody knows who you are. Gotcha. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hari Jen. The Cougars are back and ready to roll. The school year has started off strong for the students with their first fun Friday taking place where students were able to go out during their lunch periods to engage in games and dunk their favorite teachers in the water tank. 
Specifically for the seniors, they had a senior sunset where they were able to reconnect with their fellow peers, eat pizza, and just have a great time. To address the nuts and bolts of the start of senior year, there was a senior meeting where information regarding CRC help, ways to approach the common application, and how to best balance school life and extracurriculars were shared. Although seniors are stressed about learning how to best balance their school life, extracurriculars, and college applications all at once, resources such as transcript workshops in the CRC help to ease the load on their shoulders. With stricter cell phone policies in effect, such as cell hotels and jails, students have different opinions regarding them. Freshman Mariana Tiluxing is okay with the policies because she feels it greatly benefits her education and feels relieved knowing where her phone is all the time. However, different grades show a variety of opinions. A sophomore said that um, a sophomore said that she misses the certain liberties that came along with having her phone within her reach, such as texting her parents, listening to music, and going on it during downtown downtime. However, a student in grade 11 claims that it may cause anxiety in students because in case of emergencies, they can't immediately contact their parents. Seniors showed indifference towards the policy. Generally, the student body is accepting of the policy and understands the need to enforce them. Next, with the new and improved cafeteria, students are responding with positive feedback. Katie Hughes, grade 12, noted her appreciation for the food options and snack varieties available to the students, adding her avid love for the curly fries. Some students, such as Abby Lee, wish for more healthier options with more fruits and vegetables in the mix. With new and delicious foods, students are more energized and awake during their school day. Along with that, the cafe has sparked much enthusiasm in students because they love the wide range of drink options that are available to them to caffeinate them a bit when they need or just when they're craving something sweet and delectable during the school day. It truly is a sweet treat for students and makes them look forward to coming to school. Furthermore, with the decision to make lunch leaves only permitted for seniors again, grades nine through 11 show a bit of dislike for this. A student in grade 11 claimed that she very much looked forward to the lunch leave because she was able to enjoy it last year. However, the seniors are obviously in favor of this decision, loving the return back to tradition. For the fine arts department, auditions for the fall musical Cinderella are taking place August 22nd and 23rd, and students are ecstatic to be involved in such a fun theatrical production. The Cougars are excited to take on another year with enthusiasm, drive, and motivation. Thank you. I'm Ariel, it's a pleasure to be joining you all today. Over these first eight days of school, staff and students grew acquainted with new policies and reacquainted with lasting school traditions, finally back in full force. Staff received new assignments for in-school duties, reverting from the post-pandemic duty distribution. Like a number of other teachers, language teacher Profe Wilson was reassigned from tutoring in the Academic Resource Center to supervising hallways. He reports that both duties do well to accomplish their very different goals, both worthy of a full period assignment for staff as they address very real yet distinct needs at our school. With teachers shifted out of the ARC, peer tutoring and leadership regained its prevalence. Senior Jonah Hansen, a member of the ARC's exec, shares that leadership hopes to host more peer tutoring sessions in the year prior through establishing the space as a casual hangout spot, but also having it be a good place to study and by, making a, but, and by making a good impression on the underclassmen so that they keep coming back for help. With clear plans for student support and retention, this school year's academic support system is starting on solid footing. Over the summer, the Vernon Hills chapter of the Future Business Leaders of America took part in the nat took part in the national stage of their competition. Griffin Nichols, a sophomore, shared many memories of meeting people hailing from across the country, highlighting the many opportunities to take photos with new people and trade pins with them. Griffin says that the FBLA Nationals opened his eyes to the wide world of FBLA and have inspired him to challenge himself more and be more involved. The sights and sounds of years past have filled the halls, both old and new. The shifting of hallway traffic as freshmen collectively recognize the correct side to walk on, the familiar clamor of aspiring student athletes at the recent after-school athletic orientation, and the commitment on the faces of upperclassmen trying to find a rare empty seat in the upper commons harkens back to the culture we seniors picked up in our limited time as freshmen. New developments like phone restrictions were, typically, were taken largely in stride, serving as an inconvenience to some, but leaving the student body largely in phase. David Wang, a senior, cites that it makes sense that students aren't allowed to have phones during class, considering how distracting they can be. Students still effervesce with the excitement of a new school year as they enter the rhythm of a school day, eager to see their peers pass the school day in, more complete, in a more complete gamut of activities. Shipping in to create a positive year-long atmosphere, enthusiasm for the upcoming school year seems to only grow. Sorry. 
Hey everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Fatima Manshawi, and I wanted to start off our LHS student report by speaking about the beginning of the year so far and some traditions we have. So one of the most important senior traditions is the senior, senior, senior union. And um, this happens the night before school starts and it took place August 10th this year. And um, this reunion started off with Dr. K talking to all the seniors about setting the standard for the new year. He reminded us of what it takes to be role models for the underclassmen and show them how to be wildcats. And this allowed all the seniors to think about how we can influence the, grade young, the grades younger than us and how to show them school spirit and leadership in a positive way. And then student council executive board introduced the homecoming theme and spoke about our spirit packs, which are going to be distributed next week. And then Mr. Woods spoke about organizing a spirit section for sports events and recruiting seniors for it, which I think they're currently um, applying right now. And then finally, some senior wellness leaders spoke about Green Dot and how to maintain a safe environment at school. Afterwards, seniors went outside and enjoyed some pizza as we talked about our last first day and goals for the new year. So this is from the senior perspective. So I wanted to bring in the link crew, which is the freshman perspective. So this is an important activity that starts with the freshman orientation. This was led by link crew, uh, LHS link crew leaders who are juniors and senior leaders who were chosen through an interview process and display a positive and healthy school environment. Link crew leaders stepped up by sharing some important information to freshmen about high school and how to reduce their anxiety and make them more excited. They also gave tours and walked them through their schedules. Since then, link crew leaders began meeting twice a week with their, with their groups, and um, this was only for half their lunch periods. And then they would also prepare for these meetings by having um, a full training day on Wednesdays. And then additionally, some activities that are coming up are, um, include um, green dot training for freshmen. So this Friday, wellness coordinator, coordinators will visit freshman classes and teach them about green dot and how to become more proactive in preventing bullying. This includes training, training students to become bystanders who can intervene and stop bullying and violence in school. This will improve the school community, reduce bullying, and, and then allow students to understand the consequences of bullying and needing to step up and create a safe and inclusive environment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Wu. And um, in relation to activities, we also have an activity fair that is taking place during all lunch periods on August 31st. And this is an opportunity for clubs to kind of show like what they're there for and like why they're created. And it gives a chance for underclassmen and anybody who's interested to kind of see what these clubs are about. And we have a very, very diverse group of clubs at LHS. And some of the um, some of the new ones are Scone Thugs and Harmony, which is a kind of like a music appreciation club where you listen to an album like every two weeks, I think, and eat some scones while you're at it. Um, <laughs> What's the name of the club? Scone Thugs and Harmony, which is a play on Bone Thugs and Harmony. Um, also, a new club that was created last year was the um, is Asian American Pacific Islanders Unite Club which celebrates, um, you know, like Asian American culture and helps bring those people together, which is also, and all of these clubs are open to all people, regardless of their um, background or uh, like cultural background or like any background when it like comes to like any of the clubs. So it's open to everybody and everybody can kind of explore what they want to do. Um, also, uh, something that's super important at LHS is um, kind of mental health awareness. And so in September, we celebrate Yellow Ribbon Week, which is all about mental health awareness and kind of spreading the message that um, students at LHS are never alone and there are always resources available at LHS um, for kids who might be struggling or who are um, who like feel like that they need like support. And so we have um, education about our LSTs and how students can access those, which have social workers and guidance counselors that can um, help give support to those who need it. And we also um, have Wrigley, our school therapy dog, who is very, very popular. Um, Wrigley is like in one of the LSTs pretty much all day. And um, people, even when it's like not yellow room, people can just like pop in, give Wrigley a pat if you're like ever feeling stressed or anything. And um, 
Another Yellow Ribbon Week event that is happening that, oh, by the way, a lot of these Yellow Ribbon Week events and like uh, a lot of the biggest things are planned by seniors and it's very much senior led. Dr. Nelson, our health and wellness coordinator, kind of supervises it, but the seniors are mainly taking the lead with these. And one of the events that are being that's being planned is um, during lunch periods, having fellow students and seniors talk about their own experiences with mental health and how, and we want um, kind of like students to be able to resonate with fellow students instead of like adults just speaking to them about mental health awareness. We wanted students to be speaking to students. So that's um, another thing that's been worked on. Um, for sports, we actually are at an all time like high for enrollment. And I don't know if that's the correct word, but enrollment for sports practices are in full swing. Um, there's actually a soccer game happening right now. And our first home game is next Friday. Um, as the captain of the varsity girls swim team myself, I am just super excited. There's lots of new energy because we have to worry about COVID a little bit less. And it's just really been great, like coming together and like having sports kind of back at their full capacity. And another uh, fun little tradition that we have at LHS is uh, carpool spots, which is basically, um, and and so you get to, it's a incentive for people to carpool when they're seniors to carpool to LHS because of our limited parking space. So what you can do is you submit like a form that says you're interested and you get to uh, paint a spot, like you get to pick a spot at the front of the school and paint it. Um, and instead of having to like go through the lottery for normal parking spots that all the other seniors have to do, you get like a little spot and you get it for the entire year and you get to paint it with a fun little drawing. And I got to do that too. And it was super fun. <laughs> all right. Uh, can yep. my phone working? Sorry. <laughs> Moving on to fine arts, the fall musical at LHS is up and running. LHS stage players is putting on Grease and students are really excited. Fine Arts at LHS is back in full swing and we're excited to get back after the COVID pandemic. So no more wearing masks and shows. So that's going to be pretty nice. And they're currently in the process of casting roles and starting with crew for the show, which will be put on later this semester. LHS has had a big change to our lunchroom and we recently changed our policy on run lunch release, meaning if students are able to leave campus for lunch. In the past, before the COVID pandemic, only seniors were able to go out for lunch. But then in 2020, we changed this to stop people from all congregating. We allowed all students to go out for lunch. But now that things have been winding down, it's now been just seniors. And seniors are happy about this, but a lot of the underclassmen aren't too pleased. As well as this, over the summer, LA just changed the company providing our lunches. And this was selected following a study that the principal's advisory board put on, where students are able to like advise the LHS administration. They noticed some problems with the layout of the cafeteria, as well as the food not exactly being the best or the most healthiest. And most people have really enjoyed this, um, this new switch and the cafeteria has been great. And even better, the lunch ladies that students really know and love have been able to stay with us, which has just been amazing. Um, one of the major changes was the seating so that we could organize it a lot better and have areas where people could be quieter in the cafeteria, like bar style seating where people could sit alone and work and also different sizes of tables, like two person, four person, or like the big tables. But unfortunately, there's still just as much noise as the cafeteria as ever. But this new seating change has still been pretty cool. There is one issue with the switch in the food provider, which is that cookie prices have gone from 75 cents to $2, which <laughs> students really aren't too happy about. <laughs> that's almost one, that's more than 100% increase. So students aren't too pleased with that. But overall, the switch has been really great and it's really improved the LHS cafeteria. Another policy change has been that of cell phones. And they've been teachers have been trying to put in new policies to stop phone usage in classes. And a lot more teachers than ever before have been making students put their phones in their backpacks during class or possibly just introducing phone gels where they have to drop their phone off in the beginning of the class and then they can't have it for the rest of the class. Most students aren't too pleased with this. They listen to the policy and they don't use their phones for the most part, but there are some people who are still using their phones. Lots of people want to be able to go on their phones in their downtimes or send messages if they need to, but for the most part, students are listening and they're mostly okay with it. Just a little bit of displeasure, which is to be expected with phones. 
Um, that's all that we have. Thank you so much for listening to our report. And we're looking forward to working with you for the rest of the year. LHS has had a great start to our year and we're excited to keep moving forward. Nicely done. Thank you all. Um, not to put you on the spot. I, I do want to know, did anybody have any questions for, I got to get this right for Sarah, Hari, Ariel, Fatima, Sarah, or Jasmine? Oh, Sophia. no, Sophia. Yeah. Not Sophia. Oh, Sophia. See, here I was thinking I got it all. I got it all done. I'll also, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. Does anybody have any questions for our student board members? We would love for you to stay if you want to and if your schedule allows. However, as we move on to the business portion of the meeting, if you have to go because you have homework, a test, a practice, any other commitments, we understand. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, moving along, uh, next item on our agenda, um, we have two representatives from the District 128 Foundation for Learning. So I would love to invite Diane Phillips and Erica Rendell to address the board about the little review on what the foundation does and about the big event. Thank you for the opportunity to um, present to the board tonight. My name is Diane Phillips, I'm the executive director. And my name is Erica Rendell. I'm the secretary on the board, as well as uh, leading the committee for the big events. And I have a son uh, who's a sophomore at Vernon Hills. I'd like to start out and just give a brief introduction to, um, about the Foundation for Learning. Um, the mission of the foundation is to enhance and enrich the District 128 instructional program by obtaining resources through community partnerships, which Hopefully you'll see by the end of the night, uh, our presentation at the end of the night, um, that uh, we have been successful in doing that. A brief history of the foundation. Um, it was founded in 2007, um, and it is a designated 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, the board of trustees is a volunteer, and we are community-led. And what I'm very proud of is to date, we've given $518,762,000 back to Libertyville and Vernon Hills since 2008. So we really have four key initiatives that we focus on to execute our mission. The first is what we call our Students in Need Fund. So this is to ensure that Students that are in difficult financial situations receive funds um, and support that they need in order to keep the focus on learning. Um, we have a separate fund designated for this specifically, and to date that's raised over $107,000. Also, just to note, those funds are um, delivered to students via counselors in both of the schools as they're closest to what the students' needs really are. The second big group is our Daring Innovation Grants and Special Projects. So every year we open up the opportunity for teachers to submit proposals into us on different ideas that are really gonna make their subjects pop in their classrooms and help, again, enrich those learning environments for the students. To date, we've issued 182 grants totaling over $282,000. Um, so we're really pleased with um, how that has been going and getting to see all of those projects come to life every year in our schools um, and hearing about it through the students is really amazing. Um, we've also been able to give over $128,000 directly to the schools for different uh, special projects that they've needed over the years. Uh, the next big bucket is our scholarship program. This we actually just started in 2021, uh, where we give $500 scholarships to graduating seniors. Um, and since we've started, we've uh, acknowledged 10 um, really great seniors um, who've, who are going on and doing amazing things. So this has been a really nice opportunity then to kind of link in to our last bucket with alumni outreach, right? Part of this is getting funds through community partnerships. And so continuing that community um, through our alumni, we think is a really important opportunity. Um, 
We started the Alumni Achievement Awards in 2014. Every year we highlight a student from both Libertyville and Vernon Hills High School who have been out of school for at least five years. Um, anybody can nominate uh, an amazing alumni. Um, so please do, those nominations are open all year round. Uh, and then we highlight them at our big event every year. So if you want to nominate somebody, would you go to the foundation website to do Absolutely. That? Excellent. Yes. Can you tell us if you know, what is the foundation website? Uh, D128.org backslash foundation. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. And there's more information on all of these things on the, on the website for sure. Um, but we also have a monthly newsletter that we send out. Um, and right now we have over 6,000 emails that um, we get to communicate with every month. So that leads us into the next page, the big event. So I'm so excited because this is our annual fundraiser. This is where we make the predominance of the money that is then funneled back into our schools and to our students. So we're really hoping that everybody here will come. Um, this year, uh, we are hosting it on Saturday, November 5th, uh, starting at 7 to 11 at White Deer Run. Um, and for the first time, we have, are bringing in some professional entertainment with dueling pianos. Uh, so it's really going to be a fun time. We'll have a dance floor, and um, I think everyone's going to really, really enjoy it. So appetizers, desserts, um, you know, food will be available. There'll be a bar there. Um, but on the fundraising side, we will have a silent auction, which we are currently in the midst of gathering items for. So if anybody has anything that they would like to donate to the cause, please hit up Diane or myself. Um, we will have a specific student in needs fundraising element. Um, again, we'll highlight those alumni achievement awards, uh, and we'll have some other fun raffles and things like that for the night as well. So, uh, tickets are $75 per person. Uh, but if you are a staff, um, member of D128, those tickets are $45. Um, and we have a website where you can go, if you go on our website, you will get connected to, um, be able to purchase the tickets or use the QR code to get there. So we, we invite the entire community, whether you have children that are in D128 now or about to be in, uh, cause I know I went the first time before my son was even in school and it was a great time and an opportunity to get to know, um, the people that make, you know, our school so awesome. So. Um, I'm excited to get to work on this and um, thank you for your time. When are tickets on sale? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, tickets are on sale now and uh, and uh, we're seeing some really good feedback and uh, people excited to attend. So thank you. Th those tickets are easily purchased online. Is that correct? That is correct. Outstanding. At d128.org slash foundation. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and taking the time. And we are, the district is incredibly grateful for the work that you do and the support that you give our students and our teachers. So thank here. you. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have one FOIA request. Yes, one forward FOIA request. Um, and it was from Dennis Duffy who requested email communication sent to or forwarded to Denise Herman on or around Tuesday, the 15th, Wednesday, March 16th, and Thursday, March 17th, titled important update and feedback requests, or any email containing the words union or negotiations. The time spent was 30 minutes and the response was sent on the 16th. So very quick turnaround time. Great. And we have a donation acknowledgement as well. Um, that's okay. Looks like it's from Holly Rossi from NetGame Motors in Lockport, Illinois, who donated uh, on June 2nd of this year, a Hyper 9 electric motor to the Vernon Hills High School CTE Applied Technology Department. Um, we are very grateful for that donation. And we acknowledge that um, with gratitude. Um, next item is good news. And I will turn it over to Dr. Herman. Yes. More wonderful things happening in the district. Um, Vernon Hills Library Media Center was named an exemplary school library by the Association of Illinois School Library Educators, or IL. 
Established in 2018, the award recognizes school libraries throughout the state that exemplify the standards set forth in Linking for Learning, a book that includes school library teaching standards determined by IELTS and ISPE. Six schools were named exemplary school libraries this year. Um, Librarian Monica Caldicott will receive the honor at an awards presentation at a conference in November. So again, we're in the space that is being recognized. And they do an outstanding job, not only providing materials, but supporting media liter literacy education among all of our students, which we know is an incredibly important uh, resource. And we're very grateful and thrilled with the acknowledgement of their good work. So congratulations to yes. Monica and the whole Monica team. Monica and the whole team. Absolutely. Next up, the Libertyville Marching Wildcats raised over $8,000 in its annual Change Drive fundraiser held during its summer band camp. The money will support local charities. Um, Vernon Hills School Resource Officer Dan Mead received the 2022 Lake County Juvenile Off Officer Exceptional Performance Award. He was nominated by his peers. This award recognizes Officer Meade's demonstration and commitment to the youth of Lake County and his significant contributions to promote the advancement of juvenile systems in Lake County. Officer Meade is in his third year as the SRO here at Vernon Hills and will start his 24th year with the Vernon Hills Police Department. Then we have um, another wonderful fundraising event, the recent LHS Cats Care Fundraiser raised $9,000 for the Highland Park Community Foundation July 4th Fund. The event was organized by LHS dance coach, coach Casey Dugan and LHS cheer coach Aaron Vance. During the event on August 5th, 300 kindergarten through eighth grade participants traveled through five stations of games, activities led by LHS athletes, coaches, and staff including soccer, an obstacle course, kickball, volleyball, and everyone's favorite, capture the flag. Uh, more than 80 LHS student athletes volunteered to assist with this wonderful community event. Next, we get to celebrate our own Mary here, our Director of Communications. She was selected and our district as winner of the 2022 Illinois chapter of the National School Public Relations Association Communication Contest. Her entry, D128 Daring, the podcast, episode seven, D128 Equity Focus, student and student affinity groups, was judged to be the highest quality by school communicators from across the country. Yay. <laughs> We will be recognized at the INSPRA Awards next month in Oakbrook. And again, very, very proud of Mary and not only the podcast, but all of the other amazing productions she does to celebrate the good work of our district. And lastly, Chris Childers, LHS 2000, was named to Big Game Boomer's most famous celebrity fan for every school list as the most famous celebrity fan for Middle Tennessee State University. Childers is a sports talk radio host with Sirius XM. And that is all the good news. Thank you. Um, and I do, uh, the other bit of good news I do want to acknowledge, we uh, kicked off the school year. It has been a wonderful start to the school year. And I thank everyone in our buildings who have worked so hard to return us to school in a way that I can only describe is as a celebration. So thank you. Uh, we are grateful for the way that the school year has started and look forward to having a fantastic year. Um, next, we'll move right on to our consent vote agenda. Again, these are items that we've all discussed um, extensively in committee. I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda. Please remember to say your name before you uh, motion or second. Rooney, I motion to uh, approve the consent vote agenda as presented. Kulkarni, I second. Excellent. Do we have any discussion? Okay, seeing none, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Motion passes. The consent vote agenda is approved. Moving on to other items for action. 
um, I will turn it over to Bryant for our board policy second reading and adoption. Nope, not hey, not to Bryant. Yeah. Jim, this is it's his gig. Okay, I'm good with it then. Um, so we have our second reading and adoption of our board policies that had been previously presented first reading um, back in July um, at PMP and our board meeting. And we also had a second reading at our PMP at our August meeting. Um, these uh, policies as presented um, are changes as recommended by um, press policy that we subscribe to. And so you can see them all listed in there from um, starting with policy 2230, policy 330, policy 410, policy 470, policy 540, 580 and 5240. Um, and then in um, instruction section six, policy 6140, 6290, 6330. And then in section seven, policy 715, 7270, and 7285. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, we had discussed these extensively in committee. Um, there were a couple of minor adjustments that were made based on those discussions. Um, so I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the board policies for second reading and adoption. John Key, motion to approve and adopt 13 updated board policies as presented. Batson, second. Thank you. Do we have any discussion? Just a quickie. Um, I failed to mention, Cara, you had brought up a question about the chain of command one. I just, yeah, you saw it and you're all good with it now. Yeah, and home, I think the only two. It's just one struggling. In the, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I have a roll call, please? Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Great. Motion passes. We'll move on to educational tour requests. I believe that is Dr. Sanchez. Yeah, so we have two additional tours and make it to the last committee meeting. One is for a volleyball tournament down in Effingham. Um, the district has participated in this tournament in the past, as well as the tennis tournament. However, for the 2020-21 school year and last school year, they didn't attend any of these tournaments. Um, the lodging is itemized in their FY23 budget request for the travel, travel tournaments account. And they are um, also using the activities uh, dues and fee account to cover the entrance, um, as well as the district athletic gasoline account. And then each sport is using their... Um, own um, student activities account to cover the meals for the students. Great. Does anybody have any questions about the educational tour requests? Okay. Then can I ask for a motion to approve the educational tour requests as presented? Carmichael, move to approve the educational tours requests as presented. Hessel, second. Any further discussion? It's just so exciting. <laughs> I'm just so glad to see that these are happening again. <laughs> Agreed. Okay, Carol, roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Great. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to employment of employees, we have nine employment items that were received after our last PNP committee meeting. <laughs> Um, Bryant? As you can see in front of you, there's um, some ESP, um, educational sports staff, and then um, coaching extracurricular staff changes, some uh, replacements and resignations presented to you. Okay. Can I please have a motion to approve the um, employment of employees? Benjamin, motion to approve the nine employment items as presented. Carmichael, second. Great. Any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, finally, for action, um, the disposal of obsolete equipment. We have uh, a squat rack at Vernon Hills High School. Sorry two squat racks at Vernon Hills High School and a pitching machine at Libertyville High School. Um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the disposal, please. Rooney, motion to approve the disposal of obsolete equipment as presented. 
Gokarni second. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? I have one maybe suggestion or question to make is, you know, we're always disposing of, you know, this obsolete equipment. Maybe if it's not too much work, can we put like a counter of how much we've saved, you know, on the board docs or something every time we dispose something, what that amount is? Not sure I understand your like, question. Why to date? Year to date, how much we disposed of and what, what's the cost of that? Is it too and much? What, well, I, I guess my question would be, why would we want to have a running tally of the cost of obsolete items? Because it's it's a savings ultimately to to the district, right? However small, no? Not necessarily. Most, most of the time, the things that are disposed of Usually by the time they're disposed, they're fully depreciated okay. already on our capital assets. So right. that's why a lot of times you'll find when they put in like the value, they're like, they don't really know when it was bought a while ago. We use this, we try to filter for things that like if they, if the value is diminutive, we don't bring it here because that board policy allows that. The okay. reason it comes here is because the board policy requires that. Um, and it helps with our tracking of capital assets for depreciation and stuff. Then never mind. So, we do. I mean, we do keep a, a track of all our disposals because that's part of our capital asset reporting. At the end of the fiscal year, we could always like share that that bit, that total list um, yeah. by the end. So at the, yeah. at the end, yeah, like we just we just we have ours for last fiscal year that we could easily share. Okay. Um, it just yeah. would it be helpful to include it in the board packet somewhere? Yeah, just yeah. so that you could. Look yeah, at I mean, it if you I think wanted it to demonstrates that you know you have good discipline over this, and you know the the more you take credit and share it with the community, I think the better you're doing it already. So. Sure, I just so we kind of reconcile that on an annual basis, so we kind of keep a run as the whole year goes, and then once the fiscal year resolves, that's when we really put yep. all the final touches. So that's fine. Like on a cyclical level, like the best would be you know, after the fiscal year is finished and those books are closed out. I think that's fine. So, yeah. Okay. So next time we'll share the one that we just did for last year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a process or a clearing house for donated items? Like how do you go about actually finding out whether or not anybody wants squat racks? Um. That particular item, I don't know. So depending on where they get it from or if they're replacing something, um, a lot of times our department chairs in those areas have really good contacts and sometimes they can they can work out a deal with the company that we're buying the new equipment from. That's happened before. Um, it kind of depends on what you're talking about disposing. Um, we still are working on coming back with a thing of like, all right, we approve for the disposal, what actually happened. Right. So stay tuned. That's still coming. Okay. Uh, it's just not here yet. So, and that's something we appreciate. It's um, not the highest priority, but we we definitely love to see things that we can't put to use, um, put to good use in other districts that might be able to use it. So um, we appreciate you accumulating that information, and whenever you're able to report that back to us, that's fine. Yeah, we'll get it soon, real soon. Okay. Then. Um, if there's no further discussion, we have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call, please. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Great. Motion passes. So that completes our items for action this evening. Next up for discussion, uh, we have an update on our uh, district racial equity, diversity, and inclusion policy. Yes, I'd like to celebrate our first presentation from Larry Varn, who is our new District Equity and Inclusion Coordinator, and he's been working in consultation with other members of DLT and both building um, equity teams to prepare um, this follow-up. We made our first presentation to the board in April, where we reported on some of the benchmarks and indicators that we were able to gather data for then, and this is phase two additional data that we've been able to gather that are showing uh, benchmarks towards the equity policy. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Fine. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Good evening, everyone. I'm here to provide an update on policy 7 colon 12, our racial equity and diversity 
and inclusion policy. This presentation, as stated by Dr. Herman, is an executive summary of the detailed report that is contained in your board packets. This presentation is an extension of the updates that were provided to you in April 2022 and will address the commitments that were not reviewed at that particular time. The data contained in this presentation reflects the 2021-2022 school year, but will also provide some next steps taken that will be taken in the current school year. Mm. It's the life of a teacher right there. <laughs> ah. ah, there we go. <laughs> Here in our district, we define equity in this way. This definition was coined by the stakeholders involved in the development of our racial equity, diversity and inclusion policy. It represents the consensus of those voices who authored this policy. It is how we have and how the Office of Equity and Inclusion will continue to define this work. We believe that it is important for us to value those stakeholder voices that went into creating this definition. We wholeheartedly embrace this meaning of equity for students in District 128. The Office of Equity and Inclusion comes now to define our vision and mission for our work. Our vision describes the future and what this office strives to achieve for our community. In D128, we want every child to feel seen, heard, and included. Ensure that every child gets what they need in our schools, regardless of where they come from, what they look like, who their parents are, what their temperament is, or what they show up knowing and not knowing. And every child leaves our schools with the skills and tools to pursue a fulfilling life without limitations. And in alignment with our district mission, the mission of the Office of Equity and Inclusion is to continue champion opportunities for every student to be daring. And our motto is simple. All means all, period. Because in D128, all must mean all. And to paraphrase the words of Angela Davis, we can no longer just accept the things that we cannot change, but we must commit to and dare to change the things that we can no longer accept. And we cannot and will not accept an education that does not include all of our students. D-128 demonstrates this commitment through our 11 commitments for equity written in our policy. Tonight, we'll receive updates on commitments three, four, seven, five, and 10. Many of these commitments overlap and we will combine them into three areas that will include student supports, professional learning, human and physical resources. In commitment three for student success, one of the metrics includes measuring our social and emotional state. We will do this by administering and reporting data from climate and culture equity surveys. Results from the 2022 Illinois Youth Survey show that over the course of last year, more than 80% of our students district-wide never experienced bias-based bullying on our campuses based on their appearance or disability. However, when asked about bullying based on religion, sexual orientation, or race and ethnicity, nearly one in four students said that they had experienced that type of bullying in our district. And a significant portion of those students reported that it had happened more than six times over the course of the year. This particular survey did not differentiate between religion, sexual orientation, or race and, race and ethnicity. Rather, it was, all question, it was all lumped together in the same question. A second data point used to measure this metric was the Panorama Social Emotional Learning Survey. 
This survey was administered to students in the spring of 2022. The survey is broken out in such ways. The gray boxes at the top provide the overall percent of students who responded favorably to the prompts in each of the eight categories. Below that is how each racial, racial subgroup averaged in comparison to the overall average. The orange boxes indicate a significantly lower correlation in difference of favorable responses from how the overall average responded. Let's dive a little deeper into understanding what it means to have a favorable response by looking at one category that is particularly concerning for us as a district. This particular question is around our students who are experiencing challenging feelings. Students were asked during the past week, how often did you feel angry? A favorable response for this question would have been almost never or once in a while. An unfavorable response is I sometimes felt angry, frequently felt angry, or almost always felt angry. Here's a distribution of how our overall student population responded to this particular question. Other questions in this category included, during the past week, how often did you feel lonely? During the past week, how often did you feel sad? During the past week, how often did you feel frustrated? The part that is particularly concerning for us is that nearly half of our students responded unfavorably when asked questions in this section. In our Black and African American students, only 42% 40, of those students responded favorably. This data will be utilized to inform the action plans of the strategic plan that is connected to our health and wellness goals. But it is important to note that among the eight identified categories across all eight, our Black and African-American students were the only subgroup to demonstrate significantly lower favorable responses when compared to the average. In the next month, a sample of students will participate in focus groups based on race, ethnicity, religion, and gender, and sexual orientation identities to better inform us of the experiences they are having in our schools so that we can dive into that data and figure out which of our subgroups are having the most challenges. Commitment four, around equitable resources. This metric was to identify and report on student programs designed to or created to address or eliminate the achievement and opportunity gap. Last year, we identified several academic interventions as well as SEL interventions that were designed to address this particular commitment. And this year, we're committed to ensuring that we're able to report to you the effectiveness of those programs by looking at how our students are engaging in goal setting and monitoring their progress towards success. Some metrics that we will be able to report to you on as it relates to these specific programs and interventions are diagonal placement. How many of our students are moving into higher level, more rigorous courses? Growth targets, ensuring that our students are meeting the expectations as it relates to standardized assessments. Mastery, looking at our skill-based mastery as our, <clears throat> within their classes to measure our students' ability to master the skills and standards presented in the curriculum and individual goal setting that can include that can include goals related to social emotional learning. Commitments seven and 10 reflect our professional learning commitments. Some of the metrics that we will look at in this section include reporting on the professional learning focused on culturally responsive pedagogy and identify and report on staff attendance for equity professional learning. Last year, District 128 provided opportunities for professional learning experiences in 54 unique situations. And through those 54 professional development opportunities, 1,176 participants were able to participate. 
This individual participant opportunities does include some overlap. However, as it relates to culturally relevant education, all of our District 128 departments participated in required professional development. Over the course of the year, slightly more than $150,000 was allocated towards equity-based professional learning. And the outcome is that when surveyed, those who participated with that professional learning, nearly 85.1% of them said that by participating in this professional learning experience, they believe that it would lead to improved learning for our students. This year, we want to be able to provide more qualitative data on the impact of professional learning to give an opportunity to have a more comprehensive analysis of the effectiveness of engaging in professional learning and its instructional outcomes. Prior to professional learning, we will ask both students and staff to take a survey. <clears throat> then the staff member will participate in the professional learning experience. They will have an opportunity for implementation and safe practice in the classroom. And we'll have non-evaluative observations with coaching. Then they will be able to share the best practices from that professional learning with their colleagues and then take a post survey for those students and staff to determine what were the shifts and changes that made an impact in the instruction that they received because the staff member participated in this professional learning. And finally for tonight, commitment four, looking at our equitable resources by identifying and reporting on how funds are allocated equally. <clears throat> Our formula for designing, for deciding our FTE happens this way. Students complete course requests for the following school year. Those numbers of course requests are then divided by our optimum class sizes, and that gives us the number of sections, which in turn gives us the number of teachers required for the following school year. Both campuses, Vernon Hills and Libertyville, allocate their FTE in this way. However, the Office of Business will conduct an audit on the budget allocation of each school to determine both equal and equitable <clears throat> per pupil funding. This study will examine how dollars are allocated per building to check for equal distribution and evaluate for equitable spending by program, department, special services, and per pupil allocation. The office will be exploring the most equitable funding formulas to support student success in D128. This is an exciting time to be in D128, as board member Carmichael mentioned earlier tonight. And so if the time is not now, then when will it be? And if it's not going to happen here in D128, then where will it happen? The time is always right to do what is right. This is an era of all meaning all for 128. All students are connected. All students feel seen. All students feel valued. And all students matter. That's what we will do in D128 to promote equity and inclusion for all of our students. Thank you. Larry, do you think you might want to stay at the podium to answer some questions that we might have, if you don't mind? And of course, you're expected to know the answer to <laughs> every one of these questions, information that just springs. In other words, don't worry if you don't know an answer to something right away. But Well, and thus other people at the table can help chime in too. Sure. Okay. What questions do we have? Can you give me an example of diagonal placement? Sure. So diagonal placement means that our students are moving upward in mobility from a college prep course to an honors course or an AP course. A student may start out at one level and then over the course of their matriculation in D128, they can move up to other levels as they demonstrate mastery and uh, proficiency of their skills. 
So what does that mean for like a, a freshman taking a biology class? What does the so, diagonal placement mean for that person? So biology could be offered in our sections of biology are identified in different ways. Any, any course is identified in different ways. Our highest and most rigorous level is advanced placement. Under that is our honors section. And then is our, and then is our college prep placement. A student in their ninth grade year could be in college prep biology. At the end of that year, the teacher and the student and the counselor and the parent could have a conversation around the readiness of this particular student as it relates to their meeting benchmarks and can move from college placement to a higher level, whether that be uh, honors or AP. That movement from college prep to honors to AP represents the diagonal movement. So it's not just next year they take college prep chemistry, next year they take college prep physics, they're moving over. So that's why it's diagonal. All right. Gotcha. Thank you. What other questions are there? Uh, first, I really want to thank you for the. Could you speak into the microphone, please, so everybody can hear you? Remind me all the time. Uh, You're still not speaking into the microphone. <laughs> can you hear me now? No. <laughs> Are you serious? Really? You got to get right all up right, in there. I'm going to get up in here. So, first, thank you for the presentation to supplement the report because it answered many of the questions that I had just going from the report. Um, I guess my my biggest question is the policy is so personal and building about relationships. Um, how are we, um, with that explanation on how PD, teacher PD, we can track to see how it is affecting and growing student outcomes just so we can see the progress. How do you see, we've, we've kind of reduced the ability of the individual schools to have access to support by creating a district position. So how are we going to manage that the teachers and the students still have the same access to the kind of support that they, through the department? Does that make sense? It's a great question. Are you asking that with moving from one campus having two equity coordinators to one and not having a director for equity and inclusion, how we will continue to maintain the program offerings for our yes. staff? Um, so, in in fact, uh, our we can maintain those those numbers based on there being a more centralized approach to how we provide professional development um, at a district level. Being able to uh, give our teachers and staff professional development across the district, rather than it being site based. Uh, so, it will be ensuring that all of our all of our teachers and, and are getting professional development, much like they did for the culturally responsive education piece uh, without having to pull out our uh, equity coordinators who are also uh, teachers as well from the classroom over the multiple days uh, to provide that professional development for staff. Um, rather, that can come from the district level. Um, teachers will also continue to have opportunities to register and sign up for professional development um, voluntarily and on their own. I'm thinking more of just the day-to-day -day interactions when teachers have questions they want to go, they have, they want to be utilizing the resources of the equity coordinator that now has been reduced. I know that you've, you've got a plan. I just want to make sure that the teachers continue to have the kind of support they have at the building level prior to us having made that change. I mean, just something to be thinking about to make sure um, I'm coming to you as a teacher. <laughs> so I know sometimes that when we can add more district level, it tends up being more work for the, on the teacher level. So I guess I just want to be cognizant of that and make sure that we are not, we are avoiding that. Yes. Um, and the addition of the district level position also allows the campus site, the campus space equity coordinators to have more time to focus on providing services to students. Um, and yes. that's something that was really important to them um, was to be able to um, turn, turn more of the teacher development over to the district um, so that they could focus on uh, working more with the students. So do we keep track of that in any way? 
how, well, I guess I'm, I'm thinking on the fly. Do we keep track of how the building coordinators are assisting? There are models for any coaching position. Um, actually, there's some very rigorous models where um, you say instructional coach or technology coach or equity coach has these responsibilities. And then there's a time audit system for how they're using their time by week, by month, by quarter. Um, so there definitely are some things that other schools who have the coaching position are using. We haven't used those to date, but that is definitely something I see us moving forward in, in capturing. If we say we want the equity quarters to be spending more time with students and the affinity groups, how much time were they before? How are we making that happen now? So we definitely will have a deliberate way of gathering more of that data. Yeah, I just will second. Um, I think I understand the concern. We want to provide um, uh, significant support to our teachers and staff members in the buildings. Um, and a concern is if we've uh, shifted some resources to be able to provide those resources also at the district level, have we diminished our ability to serve our staff in the buildings? Um, I think from my perspective, um, what is important to understand is that this policy in terms of equity is comprehensive at all levels of our district, um, not only in the buildings, but throughout kind of the district as an institution. And last year, our equity coordinators in the buildings were having to spend a, um, a great deal of their time helping to coordinate the district level work. Um, they were our experts. They were passionate about this work. And we didn't have um, somebody at the district level to be responsible necessarily directly for doing some of the coordination and the policy work and um, some of the behind the scenes things that have to happen at that level. So as Larry said, sometimes our equity coordinators were absent from the buildings um, because they were helping to build the system at the district level. What we're excited, what it, um, you know, I'm personally excited about at this point is our team has gotten um, multi-leveled now. So while Larry has the ability to focus kind of on the larger global district issues, uh, and at LHS, our building um, equity coordinator is able to dig in and spend the majority of her time focused on our student groups and our staff groups. Mm -hmm. And that's really where her focus um, that's where we think our building coordinators want to spend their focus, where they're best attuned to spending their focus. And they're happy to kind of say to Larry, you take the district level uh, responsibilities and, and things like that. So yeah, that's all. I'm yeah, I, I think it is something worth us tracking um, and monitoring throughout the year because we wouldn't want to see a diminishment in the quality of support we're providing our staff. Um, and that would be something I think that if if starts if that starts to surface, we would be advocating to our district for um, resource allocation to address that. It's just, a good answer, Tom. Let me just add one thing. If you look at the um, a lot of the site-based meaningful work that was done last year uh, through this policy, but also through just site-based goals and outcomes, uh, that was that work was done through leadership teams at the school. They were led by our school-based equity coordinators, but they were teamed by dozens of staff members who have a for these kids. That hasn't changed. So that that momentum continues and uh, has grown over the years. And we're excited to have Larry step in alongside of that and partner with that as he continues or as he starts to do more of the district level stuff. But that momentum hasn't stopped and uh, we're excited for Ann and um, Tarek's leadership in our buildings to continue that great work. So I, I don't feel at all like we're going to uh, misstep or backslide or, um, you know, be derailed from the good work that was happening. Thank you. And also, I, I was always concerned about and that happens, the more successful your program, the more that happens. Um, and so that ensures us the ability to continue to attract coordinators that are willing to do the work and, um, and still have somebody at the district level. So thank you for your responses. Um, I agree with um, Kara that your presentation answered most of the questions that I have after reviewing the material. Um, and I appreciate you sharing the um, survey 
that's coming up, I believe in August or September to supplement the panorama data. Um, I was curious in your professional opinion, if you could comment on the panorama survey. Um, one of the things that's really important to us as a board is having not just data driven decisions, but knowing that we're relying on really good data to make decisions and allocate resources and prioritize. So can you talk a little bit about what led to that supplemental survey that you're doing and how that fits in with Panorama and, and how we get the data to know the things that will drive those decisions? So the surveys that were issued to students gave us a baseline of information. Um, and then from there, it allowed us to open up into more inquiry mm -hmm. around what are the things that we don't see in this survey. So for example, in the Illinois Youth uh, Survey, it had those three categories, identities grouped together. Um, what the upcoming focus groups will allow us to do is to di differentiate so that we can truly identify where do we have those issues for our students, for those the almost one in four students that we had identified there. Is it around uh, bias around race and ethnicity? <laughs> is it a bias around religious beliefs? Is it a bias around sexual orientation? That will give us more specific data so that we can address appropriately what our students are experiencing um, in, the, in the schools. So the Panorama Survey also gives us an opportunity to look at a broad view um, for what our students are reporting to us, how they are experiencing District 128 at Vernon Hills and at Libertyville. And then it allows us to move more in detail uh, as we have conversation. So it surfaces and, and brings to light uh, areas of concern for us so that we can follow up. Also, just to add to that, one of the things that we'll be looking at throughout the year is right now there are um, three surveys that we do in Panorama. Um, we do a back to school, school which is the climate and culture. Um, then we do a SEL survey. And then the last one that we will do is the equity and inclusion survey that will be in November. Um, as we look at those surveys, what we plan to do is to see if Panorama is um, a system that will be able to allow us to further drill down and customize even those surveys after we get those results to find even more thought-provoking questions that can get more information out that can then also be paired with our student focus groups that we're doing as well too. Excellent, thank you. One thing that we um, learned last year when we started to customize some of the Panorama questions, however, is one of the pluses of Panorama is that it's a national um, survey. And so um, unlike other things where you only know your local data, you can say, well, what is 55% of students saying good they've been bad. bullied? Is that good, bad, indifferent? The nice thing about the Panorama survey is it does give us national norms and even by school size, by school type. So that's one of the pros of using this. Um, so we want to make sure that all of the core questions we leave intact. So we have that comparative and then we say, and what do we need to add? We can add additional questions that drill down more. So I think we're going to use the best of both. The best that Panorama has from its nationally normed and then we'll continue to refine with focus groups or additional questions. What do we need to know here that might be unique to our setting? Great. So uh, thank you again for the presentation. It, like the others have said, yeah, I echo that. I had a number of questions that got answered, but I found some more interesting, let's say things in the table, in the colorful table that you have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, forgive me if I ask the wrong question, I'm completely new to this area. So I'll go with that. But the one area that I kind of zeroed in on was the growth mindset, which I believe has probably a very close correlation to the resilience if, mm -hmm. of a daring student. And if you ignore the confidentiality protected number, which is a very small number of students, the best case and everybody else was a neutral, right? The highest is a zero and the lowest is a minus seven. That to me, that, that worried me. I don't know if I should be worried or not, but it, it kind of worried me because students, you know, leave our school and they end up in a variety of different 
situations post-graduation. Without resilience and a growth mindset, they limit themselves both professionally and personally. So as you look at plans, plan uh, action plans and such, are you looking at the column headers here and then looking at which areas have problems that are maybe more systemic? Yes. And then addressing how that should be done? Yes. Um, so across the top, those gray boxes, those are our averages. That's our starting point to let us know what things are most concerning for us. So um, in that first column, challenging feelings, we saw that overall as a district, uh, we didn't have overwhelmingly large positive correlation there. Growth mindset was at 58%, which is also not not a particularly high number for us. From that 58% underneath that column, those are our subgroups our, by race. And then it tells the, the percentage points in comparison to that 58%. So our Asians were right on point at 58%. There was no difference there. Black and African-American students were seven percentage points lower than 58. Uh, Hispanic was one percentage point lower, 57%, so forth and so on. Um, and then, uh, so that's where that's what those that's what those numbers indicate, and as a comparison to the average. Okay. So we look at the uh, first the column across the top to see what are, overall what are our concerns as a district, and then within those concerns that we have, looking at what subgroups are particularly impacted in that category. I think one other thing I hear is the idea of is 58, like I said before, yeah. how can we reference those national norms on some of these? Because uh, again, for high school students going through a lot of changes and this and that, sometimes puberty plays itself out on some of these surveys in interesting ways. So is 58% middle of the road? Is it very high? Um, wh what, what might be a growth target for us? Yeah, um, that's I, that's I think what I'm that's kind of what I'm saying because you know, I mean, not that my personal network is any of relevance, but I do hear of many students, many actually from LHS, who were high achieving in high school but couldn't handle college life mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, and then they end up dropping out and are lost for many years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that to me speaks to gro growth mindset because life doesn't happen the way that, and I gravitate towards that. I'm an immigrant woman, minority. I've, I wouldn't be where I am without having resilience and growth mindset. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm pushing that on my kids all the time too. So, Well, you're not alone. There's a very strong research base to support um, what the importance of having a growth mindset and resiliency um, so our, at the building level, we see this type of information, we see this type of data, and that leads us to being responsive in terms of saying, okay, what does this mean for us? And what adjustments can we make to our curriculum, to our programs that we offer students? We think about where do we actually teach a growth mindset? Where do we intend to teach a growth mindset, but through our actions, accidentally put in place a fixed mindset and reinforce that through our grading policies or through our actions that we take. Um, and then that also hints at areas when we want to grow as a school, if we want to look at our schedule, if we want to look at uh, advisory programs, does that provide us a place where lessons about growth mindset might be able to be explicitly taught? Um, all of that conversation occurs after we get this data and begin to think about um, its implications for our system. Thank you. So my broader question was, are we, when you look at planning and action plans, are you looking at, you know, these areas and saying, well, you know, we can't maybe fix all eight of them, but we are going to focus on two columns and four rows or what's that combination that you will say we are going to work on first and then second and third because trying to fix all of that is probably too much in one shot. So that was my broader question. Um, and so we're looking at those things that align uh, most closely to our strategic plan so that we can make sure that everything that we're doing as a district um, aligns to those goals that we've set forth in that plan. Um, but this, this particular piece of data, um, it really aligns to and falls within our health and wellness goal. Um, and so as that uh, 
as that task force comes together to develop the action plans for our district um, for the next five years around uh, health and wellness, this data will be a, a piece that they can use to inform the overall district trajectory for health and wellness. All right, excited mm -hmm. to, to see that. Thank you. I had a, another question. Um, when I reviewed commitment number seven, I was curious to get your input on accountability. Specifically, I wonder if department chairs are being held accountable for culturally responsive teaching and how they report on it. Because if they're holding the teachers in their department accountable for culturally responsive teaching, then it will be, it, it will happen. But if no one is being held accountable for implementing culture responsive teaching, I, I, my concern is it won't happen. So I'd like to know what accountability is in place. Um, I was concerned that in two departments, nearly half of the teachers saw no alignment of CRT, professional development, to their performance as an educator. And if we don't have accountability, that's not going to change. So can you share some thoughts about that? Absolutely. And can I also invite you to come sit with us? <laughs> if you're comfortable there, you're welcome to stay. But we have an empty seat yeah. right here at the table. I want me to come over and sit with you. Come yeah. sit with us. <laughs> I have a couple more questions, too. That is a great question. Yeah. Thank you. There's been a lot of really good questions. And I, I actually, it's funny, Lisa, I was looking at the exact same piece of data you were just now, and I had a piggyback question Please. on that. May I Please, pose it now? I think, um, I, you know, I'm reading this, this professional development aligned to my performance as an educator. I struggled with what that meant as in like, does it apply to me as what I've practiced in the past? Is it now that I have this information, how I view my... Uh, you know, the delivery of my curriculum, my yes. pedagogy going forward. And so I, I don't know if the wording was just problematic for me personally, but well, I just I was wondered, looking for a little clarification. Yeah. I wondered if it's possible that for the departments that had almost half of their teachers say it wasn't relevant, could it be interpreted because they thought they were already doing it? And that's why it wasn't relevant because they, they had already implemented these strategies and theories into their teaching. You went the next step to talk about the accountability piece and my brain hadn't even gone there yet. So thank you. <laughs> you're, you're, welcome. you're welcome. I was like, that is alarming. The end. Yes. So oh, yeah. your thoughts on accountability and building that in to our department chairs and teachers work. Mm -hmm. So in the 2021, 2022 school year, it was not um, evaluated in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but all teachers did get exposure to culturally relevant education and those practices. Um, in the presentation, we t I shared with you the cycle for professional development, which would allow for us to be able to see how teachers and uh, other staff members are implementing the learning that they're receiving at these professional developments, including culturally relevant education. Um, by having them bring that information back in the survey piece, it'll make sure that our staff and our students are thinking about the practices that are happening in the classroom in that, from that lens. Um, and as they're implementing those shifts that they learned through culturally relevant education or whatever professional development that they have participated in, um, that we're able to see what was the impact um, of it, um, not just from the teacher who experienced it, but what does it mean for the student? Mm -hmm. um, and I, as a student being in the class, being able to say, I see that something has changed in the curriculum, something has changed in the delivery, something has made a difference um, in what I'm experiencing here in this classroom. Um, when we talk about the opportunity for observation, uh, non-evaluative observation and um, safe practice, it, it allows our staff to be able to take risk and take advantage of the learning that they have experienced and try it in the classroom um, so that they can be supported in that way. Uh, whether that is through our department chairs, whether that's from my specific office, um, for my instructional coaches. Again, it's important that we're all, it's important that we're all um, supporting the and promoting 
equity and inclusion across our classes. Um, and uh, for those individuals who are going to a conference and everybody couldn't go, um, if there was something that they were able to bring back and try in their classroom and it worked, then we want them to be able to share those best practices with their colleagues so that the sh so that we can maximize and have a, a stronger return on our investment. We spent funds on ensuring that these people went to this conference. We want to make sure that when they come back, that they are bringing back practices that are going to impact our instruction. Um, and so those ways are ways of including um, accountability for our staff um, around Bringing, uh, bringing back the learning from their professional experiences that they've had. I want to add one other thing, and it's going back to the question you asked earlier, Cara. When we've done professional learning in the past and we get that data at the end, we aren't looking at it over time. So because Larry is here and because we have this district perspective now, it's like, oh, when we compare all of the different departments feedback and look at trends, there's some differences here. So this would be an example of that value add that we have as a district now, um, because equity coaches are amazing, but there are so many things on their plate. We have not taken this kind of global look at how are people receiving the professional learning around equity. We get and the inclusion. now what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, because that's what is always lacking. Yeah. We've gotten all of this. Now what? Yeah. What are we going to do with mm -hmm. it? Yeah. And you know, bringing all of the information mm -hmm. back. You know, I love that you are including the student response to this. I mean, that is why we're talking about this. Of course. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, as much as I want to support the teachers, the bottom line is how are we showing that this is making an experience, an enriching experience? How are we enriching our students' experience, all students? So, and I that's why, if I can interject, Accountability is so important because unless it's system wide, we're going to hold the superintendent accountable and she's sharing that accountability with Larry. Mm -hmm. But I believe that accountability has to go further than that for this system wide initiative to really be effective. So I appreciate the keeping accountability as part of how we serve students and paying attention to student outcomes. And accountability can, can, can take on multiple forms. Um, and what we really are, um, what we would like to see most is for our teachers to develop that ownership mm -hmm. of, I want to learn more about this particular strategy. I want to, um, uh, incorporated into my practice. I want to be able to take this risk um, and see how it works out um, so that I can provide a better experience from the students that are in my that are in my class. We don't want our, our staff members to feel as though accountability means um, micromanaging, yeah. um, but it's it's from the lens of we're here to support um, and we're here to work with you, coach you, give you feedback. Um, and be a thought partner with you um, as we as we explore um, shifts and how we look at our mindsets for equity and inclusion. I, I appreciate that, and I really like your definition of accountability and how that how that works. So thank you mm -hmm. for putting a, a finer point on what the district approach will be to accountability. Would it be? too much to ask for like a report out in a few months just to see what changes you know different teachers have i think the next report is, is in december is that correct i, I, I want to make sure it's appropriate to ask for this because if it's not that's fine but i mean because i'm not a teacher i was thinking how do you be how can you be culturally responsive in a math class which is just you know numbers versus maybe a history class where you have other up. So that was kind of what I was thinking. So just out of pure interest, I think if you can summarize what people have done differently since they've taken this training. Provide examples. Yeah, give examples. That'd be good. Maybe even hear from some teachers. That'd be great. Teachers and, and students. maybe some students too. I, I would, as, as a non-teacher myself as well, I would love to hear some specific examples from, we always love to hear from our teachers, so. <laughs>
of what's how fun to hear some of what's that. happening. Yeah. Something new and exciting is going on. That's could the tool, to the tool that we used, forgetting what's it, what it was called. It was like a, almost like a thought tree where people thought exchange. Thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. A tool like thought exchange be useful for something like this, where we could gather a number of statements, um, maybe almost have like a focus group mm-hmm. who could, you know, use that tool to kind of just bring it all together for us to see. I mean, I, uh, presentations and talking to people live in person is wonderful, but I think it would be great to have just a large quantity of feedback to see, you know, what's really happening and how people feel. So am I correct that the next report is going to be in December? Is that correct? I thought I, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought in reading the board packet that our next report would be in December. That sound right? In December, you all will receive the equity action plan um, that we will have completed for your uh, approval. Okay. So that's what we have coming up in December. Thank you. Yeah. Specific action plans will be shared with the Board of Education in December. Mm-hmm. So the very last line, page 12. But yeah, if it's like end of semester one, there would love to see some examples. Mm-hmm. December or January. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. I don't know if anybody noticed his bow tie, but he's mm-hmm. he's rocking <laughs> both school colors. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And I know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the superintendent's report. Wonderful. And this is good timing. So I said that monthly I would provide an update to the board on actions for the strategic plan. And in my Friday message two weeks ago, I talked about the opening day and the positive vibe that was in the uh, auditorium here at Vernon Hills. Um, One of the things that we did was... um, explain the where we are in the action planning process and saying we want teachers to all teachers will be um, available teachers ESP school counselors all staff I should say will be available to um, participate in a action planning day that's coming up on September 6th but one of the things that happened is we said who might want to take a leadership role on some of these teams and we had over 90 different people volunteer to serve on the strategic plan action committees. So that's one celebration. Um, we are right now planning the September 6th in service where the whole morning will be on um, the portion where we talked about getting a lot of perspectives from the staff on. Uh, so we say we want health and well-being wellness centers. Well, what is a wellness center? What does that look like? What do we mean by that? Um, So the staff will have an opportunity to take a deeper dive into the ones that they're most passionate about, and then to say, yep, and if I had to put my chips on actions, I would want us to invest, they'll have that opportunity. The next thing that we'll be able to do, Mary and I have been working with um, uh, a design company to help refresh our um, website. So at the end of September, we will be um, uh, rolling out an updated mailer, but that's not the right word for it, um, to sort of celebrate phase one of the strategic plan and also send people to our website. And on that same website, you know, when you send people to a website, you want there to be something there for them that's interactive. We'll have that same type type of opportunity for parents to give options. So if here's what the staff is narrowed down as action plan options, parents, what do you think about that? Um, And then in early October, we'll have the same opportunity to work with students on PSAT day. Um, So we're making sure as we go from really important goals to narrowing it down to very specific action plans that all staff have another round of opportunity. Um, All parents will have one more round of opportunity and all students will have one more round of opportunity. So the action plans you receive in December will be very well informed. That's all for today. We've got a lot of things in motion. Just seems so busy already. <laughs> Very exciting work. Um, okay, um, a capital projects update. 
Moving on to um, item 6B, the summer capital projects. Um, really, the only the only update is uh, the timelines that were shared back uh, early earlier in August at our committee meeting are still the timelines of the facts lab targeted for completion this week, but that'll be tight. Uh, Mark, will, Mark will be able to provide an update to us later in the week. And the transition pathways build out is still on track for October. So that's really not, not really any change from our committee meeting. Okay. Well, we appreciate everybody's flexibility in waiting for these spaces to uh, materialize. I know the, uh, the district has a new neighbor um, in-house. The transition program is in district office awaiting completion of their build out. They were with us for a few weeks and they are now at the Sullivan Center. So kudos to the Vernon Hills Park District for hosting those students. They will be there for several weeks in the interim. Um, many of the things they're within walking distance of the library there and some other things. So just in terms of their programming, um, the location will be Sullivan Center until mid-October. Is that what you just said? Uh, Somewhere around there. Somewhere, yeah. Mid, right. mid to end of October, yeah. Yes, okay. we enjoyed hosting them, um, but many of the things that they need required more space than we have at the district sure. office. That makes sense. Great. Okay, so thank you to the Vernon Hills Park District, and thank you to the facts teachers, everybody at LHS who's being flexible, awaiting for their space to be completed, hopefully this week. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, we have an uh, update on the Verigi Energy, that's hard to say, Verigi Energy update, uh, Verigi Energy. One more time. <laughs> Verigi Energy Audit. There you go. Yeah, so at the, I don't know if it was the last committee meeting or the one before, um, requires to bring it up kind of where are we at with that process. So uh, reached out to Verigi and they said, oh yeah, that'd be great. Let's talk about it. So uh, we had scheduled a meeting for this Thursday to review uh, their findings. So they're, what they're, we call it energy audit, but really what they're calling is a feasibility study. Is what they figured was what they completed, and so it's looking at based on every all the data that they looked at and all the observations that they had. What if what are things that they think are feasible um, for us both as the district, but also feasible for the entire consortium, the entire consortium, including Vernon Hills, different government units uh, related to Vernon Hills. So excited to see what that information we'll find, but we don't have the report. We don't have any report yet, so we're kind of kind of waiting for Thursday. Okay. Good. Well, I, I'm excited to hear what they come up with. I'm also happy to hear that they intend to put it in context of the Vernon Township and all the ener entities, government entities that are participating. So. Mm -hmm. well, apparently, they've been very busy going to each individual entity and doing these presentations because they've got, I don't know, 20 something groups that they're working with. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, moving on to fiscal year 22 site-based expenditure reporting. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, this is some data that will show up in our report card um, uh, for last year. And so we, since the inception of this requirement, um, we've included this information for you every year. And so what this is showing, so you know, we can talk about budget and plan. Like right, the budget is the plan for what's to happen. They, now it's like what actually happened. Um, so when you boil it all down uh, using the various things they want us to include and to exclude, um, we're showing $26,320 per student at Libertyville High School and $26,694 at Vernon Hills High School, um, which uh, are very close numbers, but it does show a difference of $374 per student. When we drill down that data, you know, I don't really start from necessarily from a preconceived notion. I kind of step back and say, okay, like what's going on every year? And uh, when I looked at the data for fiscal year 22, uh, the data that popped out was uh, building administration and transportation. The simple fact is we have um, similar building administration, but fewer students at Vernon Hills than LHS. So your dollar per student is higher here. So for instance, we have one principal here at Vernon Hills. We don't have a 0.75 principal here relative, right? We, we have a principal because you need to have a principal at a building. So that was the reason, so same with athletic director, the other building level things, John's John's worth it. Um, so- <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> but his job is easier probably. Uh, so so we look at the data. Uh, and so that, that makes logical sense to me, right? So we look at what is the numbers actually showing? Like, does that make sense? And it does. 
I'd say the second thing that really stuck out is transportation. We spend more per student on transportation at Vernon Hills. And that makes sense to me also because there are we have more bus routes at this building than the other building. There are more students that ride the bus. Uh, and part of the reason why is if you notice, like we're, we're not in a neighborhood right here. And Libertyville is surrounded. It's in a neighborhood. There's people that can live and walk and do that. You don't have that as much here at Vernon Hills. So there are more students that ride the bus. So that, again, made sense to me. Um, this was similar data that we had in fiscal year 19, right before the pandemic hit. And so, um, you know, th this was this was not a surprise uh, to see this data here. So. You just answered my question. I just wanted to reiterate and know that this is not dissimilar from other years. It, it's and not dissimilar from fiscal year 19, but yeah. we're this is three yeah. fiscal years away from it. So the, the pandemic years had definitely different data because, you know, when you're talking about what actually did you spend money on? Well, for the pandemic years, we had a whole bunch of things we didn't spend money on. Right. We had a whole quarter year. We didn't spend a whole lot of money on hardly anything except for salaries and benefits. So that will, that will, other things will, other things will surface as reasons. And, and, you know, we've got all the reports to show what were the surface reasons for that, that year. Like there are, like there, there are reasons that happened last year that are still true for this year, but they weren't as they, they didn't have the biggest impact on a per student basis when you look at the data holistically. I think our response to this question last year was um, Libertyville had slightly higher per pupil cost. And we looked at, and it was the veteran staff and yes. the salaries of the veteran right. staff. Mm -hmm. So because we didn't have these other, we didn't have as much transportation. So right. uh, Dan and I looked at that long right. question and we're back to, much more normal school. Okay. Okay. Right. Any other questions about the expenditure report? Okay. Um, Illinois Association of School Boards, Dr. Batson. Um, nothing significant, just looking forward to the um, conference coming up in November. We're also finalizing the, um, the speaker for the upcoming dinner um, event uh, in I think it's in October at our, our lakes division. Thanks. So I'm yeah. uh, working with the team on that. Has something, it's possible that I just missed it, but I didn't see anything, an invitation on the lakes division, the fall division dinner yet because it's not, not yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're still working on that. Okay. I think that usually comes out like in early September or something, but we're, we're finalizing the speaker for that. So that'll be coming out. Great. Okay. Uh, moving on to CEDAW. Tara Benjamin. Nothing to report. We have um, our quarterly meeting coming up on Wednesday. So I will be there. Fantastic. Thank you for being our representative and taking the time. My pleasure. Okay. Board comments and events. Does anybody have anything they would like to share? Um, on August 11th, I attended a Robbins Schwartz webinar. Robbins. Schwartz, right? Okay. Um, they did a webinar on the freedom of religion on school grounds, which was very interesting um, due to the recent Supreme Court decision um, that changed things a little bit. And the key takeaways um, that I learned that I thought I would share is, um, you know, it's prudent for districts to review their policies regarding speech and religious expression on school grounds. Um, assess job descriptions and language regarding employees' supervisory responsibilities for students beyond the classroom or extracurricular activities, and then add or strengthen language that um, addresses expression of employees on their private time that is not district endorsed. Um, and to really remember that any cons what this ruling showed us was that any concerns regarding students or other employees feeling coerced or pressured to join in any type of religious expression really must be based on evidence and proven, not speculating or assuming that students or other staff members feel coerced or pressured. Um, so I thought that that was just a, an interesting uh, topic um, because the Supreme Court decision did really mm -hmm. um, make a couple of significant changes to how freedom of expression in a school district operates. So, yeah. Okay, then if uh, nobody else has anything that they'd like to share, anybody wanna chime in? 
I've um, been looking forward to seeing everyone Thursday night at our board retreat. Yes. Wait, what? <laughs> I may need a pass because I won't be at open house. Yes. Will the superintendent give me a pass? I will give you a pass. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Libertyville has their um, their open, open house. house. So thank you for a Libertyville parent who is going to make the sacrifice of working on good board governance to to Libertyville parents. Thank you very much to both of you, so Sonal, and Cara. What? Oh. Three board parents. The elementary, 73 has their open house. Oh my house. goodness. <laughs> well, everybody's okay. making a sacrifice for the good governance in our district. And right. thank you for doing that. Um, and I'll just remind us, our homework is to read all three of the board policy manuals that were provided um, and come prepared to discuss which sections um, you feel strongly about. Um, we've got a great agenda planned and we're looking forward to it. Um, so if there's nothing forward, can I ask for a motion um, to convene in closed session for the purpose of discussing an employment of an employee under 5 ILCS 120 2C1? Carmichael, so moved. Batson, second. Great. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Paul Carney. Aye. 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 Karma. Aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. We are uh, being in closed session. It is 8.51. Let's take a five-minute bio break, and then we will start our session. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Great. Can I please ask for a motion to return to open session? Benjamin, I moved. Oh, I oh sorry, Wait, Carol. Carol's, Carol's got to be here. The, the you're in suspended <laughs> animation. <laughs> I, know you're I wonder if there's a way. Is there a way that I can download I know all the board policies all at once? Because <laughs> I knew I was going to be on a plane. Lisa, and I wasn't going to have again, access. I'm can, you, um, can I please have a motion to return to open session? Benjamin, I move to return to open session. That's in second. Great. So we have a motion and a second at 9, 12 p.m. Roll call, please. No, Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Great. Motion passes. Uh, now I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Carmichael. That's in second. <laughs> you got that right. That's in. And roll call, please. Unless we'd like to discuss it further. <laughs> Any discussion? Question? Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.